Uh, as many of you are aware, uh, we're currently in the early stages of Major League Baseball season. So whether you happen to be a fan or not, I hope you'll indulge me as I invoke a, a hardball metaphor, as it is my personal honor and privilege to call uh, to the mound a most exceptional conference closer today. Uh, retired Admiral Mike Mullen really requires no introduction around these parts. A distinguished graduate of the Naval Academy's great class of 1968, uh, he commanded at every level in the U.S. Navy to include three separate ships, an aircraft carrier strike group, and a numbered fleet. His illustrious 30-plus year career culminated with his service as the 17th Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, where he served as the principal military advisor to two separate presidential administrations. In his so-called retirement, he and his wife Deborah remain staunch advocates of veterans and their families on a broad range of issues, including drawing public attention and institutional focus to the challenges of post-traumatic stress, combat-related brain injury, military suicide, care of the wounded, and veteran homelessness. Sir, welcome back to the Naval Academy, and thank you very much for being with us this afternoon. Uh, over the last dozen years or so. 
Uh, and it is not just because of a single event. Uh, it's almost in a way, it's almost become far too easy to use military power as opposed to really do the hard work uh, from my perspective. And Syria is a case in point right now. I was actually in a debate with one of the professors at the Princeton yesterday who is arguing very heavily for intervention. And I don't think that's my personally don't But the point of all this, uh, and, and what, what the premise for this course I'm teaching is that we've been through a lot, we the United States and the world, but we have been through a lot in the last dozen years. Uh, to include uh, Gitmo, torture, Abu Ghraib, um, renditions, uh, and now drones, just to name a few. And my worry is that we're all moving so fast, and the, the pace of events and the number of things that are pressing in on us, uh, that we won't sort of step back and take a strategic look at what's happened uh, and cause. And my actual worry is that the goalposts, I'll call them our moral and values-based goalposts, have moved. Uh, and we don't know that. Or we, cert we certainly haven't said, OK, they've moved and assessed, is that OK for us? And I don't know the answer to that because I'm not one certainly to do that. But I do worry that if, in the sort of the case, if we don't do that and say, yeah, they're the same and that's okay, or they're moved and that's okay, or they're moved and that's not okay, and we need to sort of adjust accordingly. Although if you asked me to pick one of those three, I'd be in the, I'd be in the second category, or the third category, sorry, that they have moved and we need to adjust. Um, and. And uh, otherwise, I just worry that we keep on and we wake up 10, 20, 30 years from now in a ditch and we have no idea how we got there. We look back and we can, you know, then you do the forensics, how did we get here? Well, this is how we get there. I don't think anybody would argue that things are going well or getting better. When I get asked, and I speak all over the country, when I get asked about what concerns me most, sort of what keeps me up or what keeps me awake at night right now, is actually, in the near term, it's debt. Uh, in the longer term, the single biggest, biggest vulnerability we have as a country is our education system. And we've all been talking about it before many of you were born, quite frankly. Uh, and we continue to watch it slide and slide in the polls every single year. And we don't have, from my perspective, we have not prioritized it in a way to make a difference. And we watched our competitors stay in school longer, do better, score, score better on schools, and quite frankly, that, and, and that's at the heart of who we are as a country, which is incredibly competitive, and we're gonna lose our competitiveness, if we haven't lost it already in the next 20 or 30 years. So that's the second thing. Third thing is the political paralysis that we're in. It's never been worse. Uh, and I'm a big believer in us as a country, meaning it's not gonna change until the American people finally really say we're fed up with it despite the fact there's not an American citizen that I talk to all over the country that says that, that message is not delivered in a way to make a difference, to get the right people in, in D.C. to make the decisions that will change this. And we've been doing this for a while, and I think we're going to continue to do it for a while, uh, uh, for, for lots of reasons. So, so I, in this course that I'm, that I'm, uh, that I've taught now, it's for two, two groups. 18 undergrad students, seniors at Princeton, and this this semester is uh, 18 graduate students. What I've asked, what I what I had them do, I said, I need you to build me over the course of uh, these three months a a values based and principles based uh, framework through which we can evaluate old problems, look at current problems, or look at new problems. And essentially, for two classes in a row, it's broken out into. What are our values? And quite frankly, as you kind of think your way through this, you can stay confused for a while in terms of what's a value, what's a principle. But after a while, it becomes pretty clear, you know, that the values are the things that really are the intrinsic things that we care about. To include, you know, our obviously our national security, the whole issue of democracy and freedom, and all the, the specifics of what that means, not just not just the idea, uh, and then things like human rights, dignity. Uh, self-expression, those kinds of things. And that's what we stand for. And in fact, 
in a lot of our in a lot of the principles that we either adopted or we violated, depending on how you want to look at it, over the last dozen or years or so ago, we started to, in, in fact, pull at those values. And in this graduate course that I'm teaching, there are, I've got 18 students, I've got four or five internationals. And one of them said yesterday, sort of, I've got one more class to teach next week, but one of them said yesterday, in, as we kind of looked at how we position values and principles, and then you start to put case studies through them as we've done, one of them said, who has great affinity, actually is, is from uh, uh, South Asia, went to undergraduate school here, first time he'd been in the United States, and now he's in grad school. But he said it was his view that, in summary, the United States has lost the moral high ground that it used to have. Uh, so that's, that's a huge worry for me in terms of who we are as a country, and obviously with my life, and many of you who serve around the world, this isn't the first time that at least that concern has been raised. And we've done a lot of damage uh, in, in parts of the world, particularly in the Middle East, particularly in the Muslim world, uh, just, to, just to talk about one area. But it's, it's more extensive than that. So how do we move forward? Now, I, I pose this question uh, about who, who leads. You know, who are the Lee Kuan Yews and Kissingers and Thatchers and Mandela's of the day of my age? I don't get many answers, quite frankly. I don't have many answers. Um, I did this uh, at a reception before a, a dinner that I was speaking at up at Princeton several months ago. And one of the one of the students turned to me when I posed this question and says, "Well, maybe it's Bill Gates and Warren Buffett, and maybe it is the the financials in the future." And I don't know that, uh, but what I do know is that without leadership, we will, as a globe, we will devolve to uh, to what I would call least favorite uh, solutions. And in that, we won't address, actively address and lead in the areas that you've been talking about for the last two days. Those are not going to just get better on their own. Um, so if I, I guess if I were going to leave you, you know, one, me one message is the huge concern that I have for the very gradual devolution of what's occurred over the last dozen years. The lack of, in, in in my previous world, and certainly the world that so many young men and women coming from all these service academies are going to go into in the military, that we have laid far too much on the military, that there is so much linkage between decisions that get made, whether it was 100 years ago in, uh, you know, in the, the Ottoman, fall of the Ottoman Empire, which we're dealing with and been dealing with in Iraq today, or whether it was 1990 in Iraq, or 2003 in Iraq, uh, or decisions in Afghanistan, which directly impact our ability to make a decision in Syria. If we had not been at war the last 12 years, I think our situation, our, our decision space in Syria would be much different if it were a one-up. It is not. We are uh, war-weary as a country. I am tired as a military of of carrying the load without the diplomatic lead, without the policy lead, without the political lead uh, that you need in any war. I've said for a long time, these are necessary, the, the military side is necessary, it is not even close to sufficient. So that, that's sort of where I am right now, those are my concerns, and I hope that, and again, looking at your speakers, um, um, and I'm sure just looking, I mean, looking at the group that they were able to state the problem. I don't need, I don't think, I don't need a whole lot more problem statement. I need leaders and solution sets here. Uh, and that's what we need to be seeking, literally at every level. And, and, and we're in a long-term climb here from where we, uh, in terms of where, in my view, where we need to go. And we're not going to go... We, we can't do it alone. One of the big questions out there that's going to continue to emerge in the next, certainly, 20 years is, so what is the U.S.'s position in the world? And how powerful are we? Should we be? What difference do we make? What are the expectations from people around the world that have had unbelievably high expectations for the U.S. and generally are still there in terms of the need for the U.S. to lead from a moral, ethical, standpoint more than anything else. Uh, 
uh, not getting into all the details of which part of the which part of uh, uh, or aspect of leadership we're talking about whether it's the economy or whether it's foreign policy, et cetera. So anyway, those are a few thoughts. Uh, I hope I didn't, I didn't expect to come in here and cheer you up. <laughs> but this is really, this is really very serious stuff. And I worry a great deal about certainly the current ability to, from what I see, to execute in a way that solves these problems. For coming, Admiral. Yeah. Uh, your question uh, got in the back of my head, and all of a sudden, I think I might have an answer. <laughs> a lot of the people that have been talking about the things that we need, and the question is, how do we get them? They're almost impossible to get at. And it occurred to me, based on your question, let's replace all the politicians all the CEOs with women who are mothers. <laughs> there is uh, <laughs> women who are qualified that are mothers. There's an article that just came out about the women politicians. You know, with more and more women who are running. And in fact, it was briefly discussed, I think, on Morning Joe this morning about how difficult it is. Scarborough said how he ran against the women, how difficult it is. Uh, and I'm, uh, I'm not, I, I understand the ethos, I understand what you're saying. Um, and I guess nothing's, you, you just don't know unless you try it. But wholesale replacement isn't what we do in this country. Uh, but I'm old enough. And I, you know, I would never talk about anybody as but I'm old, old enough where I could take something happen in 10 or 20 years, and things can happen. A lot can change over that period of time. What is what is instructive to me, at least in my life, if I go back to sort of when I graduated from here and what happened in the 70s and what happened in the 80s and what happened in the 90s and what's happened since 2000, and you just sort of put big changes, big events, there has been a ton happen in every 10-year period, a ton that has changed. Some of it's very gradual, some of it's pretty catastrophic if I were to certainly look at 9-11. Uh, so it's doable, but it, I also believe it's got to happen. It's gotta, it's got, it isn't going to happen in the town I just left, 30, 40 miles down the road. It's not going to happen there. It's going to happen from the ground up, from the American people's perspective. And, and the American people are, are concerned. They're, they need work. They need a lot of things to happen here. Uh, that haven't happened in a long period of time, um, and that's what that's what they want to see their government focus on more than anything else right now. The concern I have about that, I mean, and, and I got that that's a t that's the top priority. I don't have any problem with that. But we've got to be able to manage more than one thing at a time. And there is a tendency that's natural every time we go to war, we come out. There's a there's a natural tendency to isolate. That, and there may be times we can get away with that. This is not a world, my belief, this is not a world we can isolate ourselves from. Uh, one is it's so much more, in, it's so, so much uh, more uh, tied together than it's been in the past. Uh, and, uh, and secondly, the challenges that are out there as the world continues to evolve. And the haves and have nots, which interesting enough is sort of where I started my first port visit a long time ago in the Vietnam War was Hong Kong. I pulled up, I drove, went out on the first first time I landed, and I went up, I looked, we landed on the quay wall there in Hong Kong, and I saw this little tin box of, that was put up, uh, nailed to the quay wall there, and there was a family of 14 living in it. And I was stunned. I hadn't seen, you know, I grew up in Ozzie and Harriet's house in Southern California, and I didn't understand that kind of poverty, or that a family would basically live there for, for decades. Uh, and I... That was the first time sort of has and have nots hit me in 1969 in Hong Kong. And I said, well, gee, I'm glad I live in a country where that's not the case. I've heard more discussion about has and have nots uh, in this country in the last few years than I have ever heard of here. Those are really tough signals. And we need to do something about it. And that isn't just going to be by everybody sitting back and hoping somebody does something about it. Somebody's going to have to do something and lead it. So we talked about, uh, you, you made a point that in the three Ds, diplomacy, development, 
and uh, use of military power. It's not D, but in the three areas. <laughs> that, defense. Uh, defense. Defense. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks. Well, Thanks for reading it. Remind me. Um, the defense is being a little bit overused, over relied on. It's not a little bit. Yeah, a lot. And we also concluded, and I think there'd be a consensus, that uh, if we can link that to the, the defense spending is part of the issue, it be part of the issue. It needs to be dealt with. It's 60% of discretionary. Uh, and, and we are in a new environment since 2010. Those curves just knee up. Um, so we're looking at deficits as far as the, as the uh, I can see, which is distinctly different from after World War II. Given all those facts, if we could link, uh, get, as part of a grand bargain, the reduction in defense to the strategy that would have less reliance on defense, uh, it could be a twofer. It could be a win-win. You know, and then that's also going to reduce the, the then you alerted the, fam the um, family, the, the country to uh, way back in when you were still active duty, that the, 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 the debt is an issue now. It's a national security issue. So maybe it's a three. It takes leadership, though. So I guess my question is, if nominated, will you run? And if elected, will you run? <laughs> I'm only kidding on that. But to comment on those, those linkages, because I think they're there, and where do you get leadership to take us there? How do you get to, how do we get to what I would call preventative as opposed to just reactive? And one of the ways to, the, one of the ways that we've sustained ourselves in this environment is we have no strategy. Not only that, and when I say we, I see broadly. We don't think strategically anymore. We're, we're uh, we can almost, would be a microcosmic as a country view of, of what, people are today, you know, you're dealing with today and everything, and it's more and more and more, and I want solution sets now. But we, there's, there's very infrequently someone out there with a long view, and long views mean near, can oftentimes mean near-term sacrifice and near-term pain to get there. But we're not very good at that. So I think we need to, so I'm in this debate yesterday about Syria, uh, and, you know, with a very strong advocate to, to go in, and and I'm not a fan at this point, and not because I don't, you know, I mean, I've got 70,000 or more who've died. Uh, I'm, I, underst I understand a lot about it, and believe me, I'm, you know, I'd like, to, I'd like to see the killing stop tomorrow. But I'm not sure just by the stopping that we're going to actually stop the killing. Because if this thing grows, you know, we're, we could very easily be in a situation where there are going to be a whole lot more dead than we anticipate. Because we don't know. Because there's no view as to how does this end? Where are we going? It's got to be a regional, re, regional solution. And the power, the, the political powers need to play in that political solution. Otherwise, it's going to be near term. Stop the killing for a while. And it could well explode easily, from my perspective, explode again. And it is another example of, well, we'll just send the military in. We won't put boots on the ground. We'll do it from the air. That's generally, generally a failed strategy. Secondly, if, as soon as you start, the first thing, click if you just do one of my favorites, which is a no-fly zone, uh, which is nice and could be used very effectively politically. I, I'm not saying that. But once you do that, if you say we're going to go do that, the first thing you do is you start shooting missiles into his radar sites. And as soon as you shoot a missile into a radar site, that's an act of war. So the minimal is we're at war with Syria. Well, what does that mean? And I'm not arguing that's not the right answer. I just want this thought through a whole lot more than seemingly it's been thought through publicly. Where does this go? The fact that we don't know how a war ends or we don't think that through is not new. That hadn't just happened in the last 10 years. That's been going on an awful long time. We need to do that, particularly given these other challenges that we have, which is this is not resource free. Uh, we want to spend resources at home. We've got a military, which is just fine, although it's a little worn and frayed. Um, and it's not going to give you the answer in the end. It might give you a pause, but it's not going to give you the answer. The diplomatic piece of this is not in place. And, it, and they both need to be there. I'm a big believer in if you're going to have a military capability or use a military threat, you want that to be behind the diplomacy, and it's a team deal. That's not there. Right now, it's, 
okay, we'll just, you know, we'll stop them militarily and figure it out. I'm just not happy with that. A consensus among NATO, like I, I understood, understand existed for Libya, uh, would that help? Or is that even feasible? Political consensus would certainly help. And they, yes, for NATO it is political, although, you know, the Secretary General, every time he gets asked a question, says, no way. So, and he's not, he's not making that up. That's his, that's his political consensus. That's what he's getting from all the heads of the state, if you will, in NATO. So it doesn't mean that that couldn't help. And I, I mean, I know a lot about Libya, having certainly been on active duty when we did that. And then, uh, maybe it's serendipity, it's not anything I wish on a lot of people, but I was asked by Secretary Clinton to do the Benghazi investigation. So I go back 18 months later from when we started, I think it was 18 months or so, maybe not quite that long. And, you know, we in the military get killed for not having a phase four plan after we go into Iraq. You didn't have that. Well, let me tell you what happened in Libya. The international world had no phase four in Iraq. So I go back 18 months later, nobody's there. There's no, there was no plan, no follow-on. Uh, despite the political coalition that went in, which was important, and I, I really do believe that's important. So this is this whole issue of where is this going? And maybe in the long run, I don't know this, maybe in the long run, Libya's in worse shape than had we not done anything. Uh, and Syria is not Libya. The potential there is is much more significant. So it's you you hit a, you said a key you use the key word strategy. Where is it? Admiral, thank you for coming. Uh, Frank Delman from Austin Policy. Uh, you emphasize the need for diplomacy and policy to really lead the military. Uh, with this administration, uh, it has tried to have a, a new restart with Russia, uh, stabilization with China, um, greater friendship with Iran and such, and these have not worked. What, what is your vision of what effective diplomacy would be? That I think that we, I'll, let me just, I'll talk to Syria specifically because I think it's a good example. I don't think we get Syria right unless we in Russia are talking, unless we get some common space. And I think there's common space to be had, quite frankly, because Russia's got some huge challenges, not just in the region. I think what we should remember, and it came out to a degree, if you haven't looked where Chechnya is on a map, it came out a little bit this last week in Boston. But when I interacted with my Russian counterparts, and I actually, the, my counterpart was a good friend, we dealt with some very difficult issues, but there wasn't a conversation I had with him, the first thing he talked about was terrorism, and specifically Chechnya. They are petrified in terms of what's going on right now in Syria, and that just sort of just runs north. This is a this is a regional issue for Russia. We get to do it from across the pond, if you will, which is which has been a position we've been in frequently. Doesn't mean we're disengaged or that we don't think it's serious. Uh, so that whole issue so there's common ground there that I know is is very significant. And from my perspective, it is up to the the civilian side of our government in particular to figure out how to make that work, not just to devolve to a military answer. Um, and I, these are very hard problems. I think we underestimate, and I've been in too many meetings where we really didn't work our way through the complexities that we're dealing with. Now we're smarter about that having been through a few now. The enormously complex and one doesn't lead to another and they are all different. So I think we're gonna to have to figure out how to make it work with Russia. Chinese, China right now is just in follow, I think, generally speaking, on Syria. They're just in follow on Russia. That doesn't mean they'll always be that way. Uh, and I think we need a view from, uh, one of the things I learned is you don't just get the focus, you go to Iraq, you don't just get focus on Iraq. Or you go to Afghanistan, you don't just to get the focus, you don't get to just focus on Afghanistan. They all have neighbors. Uh, and they're regional countries. So Jordan, Turkey, Iraq, uh, Lebanon, uh, Israel, Egypt, all get a vote on how this comes out. Uh, and I don't think we can do it with, in, in particular, I don't think we can do it without Russia. So I get that it's tough, and, but President Putin just got elected. I think decent odds, he'll get elected two more times. He's gonna be there 12 years. So that's who we're gonna have to deal with. And we're gonna have to, my view is we're gonna have to figure that out and not do what 
I worry about, which is just, that's too hard, we'll just evolve to the military. Because I think the long-term aspect here, that is not going to be a good solution. And it isn't for, it isn't for lack of good people trying. I mean, I was there for, there for the reset, I've been through all that, we're going to have to, we as a country, we've got to figure that out. And I don't think we can just pull away from it, it's not going away. Sir, I mentioned first class Roberts. Um, you made a picture that we need to regain this moral authority. We also need to slow down. Sorry. <laughs> we also need to reduce the stress on the military. And as a soon to be commissioned ensign, um, do you see my job to diversify beyond just being a warfighter, but also a public relations person for the United States? And if so, how do you uh, propose, under this, for lack of a better term, Mullen doctrine, that I uh, convince the world that, I, that we are competent moral agents and that we can regain this moral high ground? You see, just out of curiosity, this isn't a test. The speech I gave at West Point in 11? I don't believe so. Okay, sir. so Google it. I mean, if you can, if you can even say those words, you know, West Point. I have to get over that because it's a joint world. Uh, and the, probably the summary is the summary there answers that question, but. It is to you and to graduates, it was applicable then, before then, to your class and for a significant time into the future, that I fear they do not know us. The American people know us in the military. And so, so you will have to be a lot more than just an expert flying airplanes or, or driving submarines or ships or whatever it's going to be. Uh, that's just the world that we live in. We have it and we will raise you. And that doesn't mean don't go do that and become the best whatever you're going to be that you possibly can. But over time, you're going to have, we're going to have to stop talking to each other and telling us how great we are. We have to go out to the American people. We're less than 1%. I've spent a lot of my retired time in the veteran space. And, it's a, and the space is really problematic. So I've got, I've got a 1,000 a day getting out of the military, which is normal. That's not an excessive number. Coming back to a lousy market. 6,000 of them have died, 60,000 have been wounded, and probably 600,000 in terms of post-traumatic stress and mild TBI. And they are the best, in this, and I can say this because I've been around for a while, easily the best group, the best military I've seen in 40, 40, 44, 48, four and a half years. Um, they have paid the price. They've done it without questioning. They've been incredible. They're great talents. There are plenty of business cases that bottom line, you hire a vet, your business, your business is going to get better. There, 50% of them are married, where it used to be when I went in, it was like 7% or 10%. Uh, the spouses want work. It's two income families. Their dreams haven't changed. Their path may have changed if they've been wounded or seen things that you or I could not have imagined. But that doesn't mean that they don't want a piece of the rock to raise their kids, go to good schools, and have good jobs. And that's the American dream, and we ought to facilitate that by giving them an opportunity, not giving them a job. Just give them, us, give them a chance, they'll take it from there. They're the best I've ever seen. That's the military you're joining. Um, but we're less than 1%. We come from fewer and fewer places. The budget's going to force us again to brack, maybe brack more. I don't know that's but it's, it's been asked for by the administration because we got 20 or 25 percent overhead that we really can't afford in an environment. This you're going to go in the first. Actually, you will go in. It's sort of the same kind of time I did many years ago. Sort of coming out of war, we were in it. But in the 70s, we were coming out of it. We're going to go through very difficult budget times right now. Uh, and if we're not careful, and I worry that we're not, and some of us who have seen this more than once. Uh, and it, nobody's talking about it by, right now, but next is going to be a J.O. and N.C.O. walk. Because the economy's going to get better, the job market's going to get better. Young ones who wanted to fly airplanes or, or train in the field or deploy around the world are not going to be able to do that because the money's not there. The only available money right now is operational money. The other money's tied up. The pay money you can't touch. You can't touch long-term contracts. So the biggest part of the budget that is being affected is, is the operational money, the training money, those kinds of things. And you're going to walk right into that. Now, I, you know, it's hard, it was for me when I was your age, have a little faith. You know, I can show you the math. It goes back in 1935, we come out of these things. And so over the course of the next 10 years, we'll come out 
But we need to be very careful about how we take this budget down. And we need to take it down. We've been flush with cash. We haven't had to prioritize. We haven't had to make decisions. We haven't had to do the analysis that we need to do. What do we really need? What kind of military do we really need to have? Uh, and then you need, back to your public affairs piece, to engage the American people. Not just back in, where are you from? Southern California, sir. Where? Fullerton. So not just back in Fullerton when you go home, when you're a local hero. I get that. You know, but, you know, I need you to go to Morcom, you know, or I need you to go to Fresno, or I need you to go to small and big places all over the country so people have a clue who you are. We're within, what, uh, 18 months of coming out of Afghanistan, whatever that number is going to be. The American people, that's going to be the end of that war, and the American people are going to move on. So our, my challenge that I see in the veteran space is going to accelerate uh, and grow dramatically because they don't know us, they haven't been invested in these wars, and they're going to move on. And that's going to make handling the issues and support for our veterans that much more difficult, despite the fact that the American people are very supportive of us in general. I share your belief that there's a mismatch or an over-reliance on military power in our foreign relations. And I have sort of a hypothesis about it. Uh, I'd like to invite your thoughts. It seems that there is a real reliance on narratives of credibility. And this is affecting Afghanistan, but Syria as well. Ideas that if we pull out too soon or leave too early, the other side will benefit somehow just by us not standing by. Karzai and Afghanistan, or now that we told them not to use chemical weapons, and it looks like they have used chemical weapons, now we've decreased our power and our credibility. And that's how I often explain it to midshipmen, but perhaps that's too crude and crass. Is it, are we obsessed with credibility, and is that part of what's keeping the military option, the, the hard power option, so uh, no, forward I, in policy? I don't, I don't know. Well, maybe this is an extension of credibility. I think, I think we, when you say we, who? Uh, or who is who obsessed? Well, it's certainly the narrative coming out of policymakers that has a lot of play in, in national media narratives about foreign policy and wars. Um, I, I guess I take it to the other question that I raised, which is, what is the position of the U.S.? Where is the U.S. in the world today? Where, where, what is our strategy? Are we, and this is different, I mean, this is a different world. But, and, and this was fairly recent back to me. I'm, a, I'm somebody that actually believes you drive outcomes through economies. Uh, and there's great potential there to make lives better and to, to create peace if you have thriving economies uh, as opposed to going in the other direction. Uh, the, so what, what I didn't understand until fairly recently was as much as we did after World War II when we got going, the percent of the global GDP we had was extraordinary. I don't, 40%, 50%, I mean, we had leverage and capability, and well, that's no longer the case. In fact, in a number of, you pick it, 10 years, 20 years, whatever it is, China's gonna be the, it's just a fact, they're gonna grow to a point where they're gonna overtake us. So relying on sort of those old tools isn't necessarily gonna work, which is why the diplomacy locker, it's gotta be full and booming, not, shredded and empty. I mean, that's what I worry about. Uh, and that doesn't mean that we haven't been working these issues hard. It is, it is a fact, from my perspective, we have been far too reliant on the military. Um, so I, to me, it's the bigger question. Uh, as opposed to, yes, credibility certainly is in there. And every, we want to be credible, and we think we are. Um, but it's the bigger question of, OK, what is the position of the US? How are we going to? assert ourselves, and I would argue that we will be every bit as important in the world as we've ever been if we adhere to who we are. But if we keep scraping at our values and adjusting them because of circumstances over time which are practical and serious, uh, um, that we will not be that country however we get there. And that is not to argue. I mean, I was... You know, I was in the building when the airplane flew in uh, under us that day. Uh, I remember the sense of fear, and we didn't know, no one knew where the next one was coming from, or if there was going to be another one. We lost 3,000 lives, and there was a real probability for a while it could be three or three or three more. We just didn't know that. 
So there is a practical side for how do you how do you make sure you prevent anything else from happening. So there's there are no easy answers here, and, and uh, so fundamentally the bigger question is okay how do we see ourselves in the world, and then are we there? How do we get there? And if we can see ourselves clearly in the world, what's the strategy to get there? And then the other pieces that are following. Yes, ma'am. Sir, I'm Eric Fitzgerald. I'm an OSD's research organization, and I direct the Minerva uh, Basic Research Social Science Program that DOD funds. And so I come at this from some bias, but you talk about the balance between uh, the diplomatic and the defense um, organizations and, and how they divide up. And I think that's there's certainly a good point there in how to take it. But I think that there's a certain uh, level of aspect of diplomacy that the Department of Defense is always going to have to keep in mind. And that's for a number of reasons. That certainly there's the, the sort of phase zero before the boom. How can we how can we prevent some of this from happening? Um, I can't see the State Department funding a lot in understanding counter-radicalization through networks or understanding how different resilience fits in. Um, there's certainly the aspect of things, our actions can cause more conflict. You mentioned drones before, so when we're targeting specific uh, specific threats, um, how many new threats are we creating and how can we measure and better understand that? And then finally, when we're investing in reconstruction or development because of these other reasons that we have to be there, how do we know that, our, that it's working and that it's having some impact? Um, I actually come from an electrical engineering background that we would never send out a new armored vehicle if we didn't know what was the material structure, where were the stresses, we hadn't tested it in, in varying weather. Um, but yet when we um, need to go and uh, deal with new populations, often there's no real validation or any type of validated theory for how we're investing our funds. So all of these are questions that I think through the force and through um, through the leadership, we need to be able to train. So my question is, um, because my impression is that you're a believer in a lot of what I'm just um, saying, but if, assuming so, how do we incentivize and how do we educate and whose responsibility is it really to keep these questions in mind? Um, I think dividing it, splitting it up to the State Department and asking them to knock on our door for doing something wrong is probably not the solution. So how do you think is the best way to integrate this into sort of the culture in the community? So not too long after I was chairman, uh, I hosted a group of NGO leaders in my home quarters. They were pretty surprised, one, that they were even there. Uh, and a couple of them told me they had some pretty heated arguments in their own buildings about whether they'd go to the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. And this is Human Rights Watch, Doctors Without Borders, a bunch of them. Um, I, Ten years ago, uh, long, you know, a few years before this, met a, a, a gal who ran an NGO at a big exercise that Jim Jones was running. I was stationed in Europe, and part of this was how do you deal with NGOs? And one of the things that just jumped out at me in that exercise was it certainly is a, it would be a whole lot better if I knew you before I met you on the battlefield, because the the differences, the stereotypes, the culture, everything. It's much more difficult when you're in the middle of a fight and you actually are dependent on each other to try to figure out how to do that. So in that evening, I'll tell you just two quick anecdotes. In that evening, I met the guy who's the head of Doctors Without Borders. Uh, and we hit it off and at least had enough of a relationship to be able to call each other. So years later, 2000, this is 2008, 2010, Haiti goes. And I'm moving heaven and earth to get as much down in Haiti as I can. And and I'm getting killed every single day in the press because every single airplane that Doctors Without Borders find medical help is getting, medical aid is getting turned away by uh, us. We're trying to set up an airport and move 20, move a 20 uh, sortie day into, into what eventually became 140, 140 sorties, but we needed a little time and space to do that. So I called Matt up and I said, what is going on here? Because Matt had, Matt had F4, and when he, got the word, when he got the word that the airplane didn't make it today, he hit F4, and another story would appear on the front page of the New York Times. And I said, you're killing me here. You know, how do we resolve this? Having that relationship allowed us to solve that in about 24 hours. And he had some gal who was in an office in New York calling somebody that was in an office down in Port-au-Prince 
uh, trying to make all this work. And I actually understand that. So relationships here, understand, we've got a ton of them now. We didn't have them before. We should not let them wane. And, and it'll be harder because we're not going to be deployed as much and we might be looking at different places. That's, that's key. The other thing that we'll all go to my grave with that just was a fact that night is one of the NGO's leaders, and I don't know who it was, said, so this is 2008. We're obviously Iraq is still front and center, but Afghanistan is coming, and we all know that. And she, this uh, woman said to me, you know, I've had employees in 1,400 Afghan villages since 1973. And I said to myself, wouldn't I like to know what you know <laughs> about Afghanistan? And I've got, I don't say I don't have any way to, to get it, but this is not, not all about flying airplanes, driving ships, driving tanks around. Um, and so, and there will be those in the military that, that complain about the whole issue of stabilization. I didn't do this to become a city manager in a country that I never even heard of before I got deployed. But there's gonna, that is going to continue. That doesn't mean we should do it alone. We need to take these lessons. And this is back to what I said, moving through what's happened. We really need some intellectual work done. What has happened here? What did we learn? How applicable is it? And how do we integrate that into the future from investment and training from people? So I've been talking to MIDS here for a long time. And MIDS, and not just MIDS, but young people, and they, uh, someone will say, well, I'm in a language. They say, well, what language are you studying? And they'll tell me French or Spanish. I said, look, I got enough Romance language. I need you studying either Arabic or Chinese, period. Because those are going to be the operative languages of the future from my perspective. Uh, that doesn't even consider feeding. You know, a, the perfect American scenario isn't everybody going to learn English? Isn't that the international language? You know, and so we don't even have to study languages, which we don't do that well anyway. No, because I'm having fluency, not even though just trying helps, but having fluency generates the kind of dignity and respect for other cultures. That, and it's this amazing, it's amazing, it's this amazing uh, conundrum because we are a nation of other cultures. Yet when we come here, we, you know, we, we blend, if you will, and then we don't pay attention as a nation to the cultures around the world that we certainly learned, some of them we've learned to understand a lot better as we went, which is not the way to do this. So that, that but the soft, and you, so you're in pen, so I, I don't even want to ask you what happened to your budget, but I'm a budget one. <coughs> so uh, we would trade our firstborn child for another helicopter. And first of all, we'll take all the education money, all the training money, all the soft money that you can't give me an ROI on. So I can buy more bullets, more tanks, more airplanes, put another radar somewhere. Uh, and in the end, that's not where, in, in the end, that is not uh, the answer for me. And so, I mean, I'm not in charge of nothing now, but it doesn't mean I don't have a view. You know, but were I there, I'd be fencing that money. And, and now, the other thing is, I'm relatively famous for saying the State Department budget needs to go up. Uh, and, and I never got to the point, because I knew where Gage was on this, where I'd say, you can take $30 billion of my money and give it to state. The only, and I believe that. The only caveat is they need to spend it well, not just give them $30 billion. And I'm enough of a money guy to know that that's just, you know, that doesn't happen easily. It has to be done. Um, but we need to do that. That's how we're going to get, that's one of the ways we're going to get the State Department, who has no appetite for budgets, no appetite for defending budgets, which is, how I grew up. That's what the Pentagon, that's what, when you're a budget type in the Pentagon, that's what you do. You know, you submit a budget, put your armor on, and you go to the hill and work like crazy to get what you, what you think you need. And in fact, you end up with about 95% of it anyway. But the State Department doesn't have that culture. That's got to change. And we have to work together. We, Gates and Clinton did this to a fairly well. It was a power, we testified. The three of us testified in front of both sets of committees, never been done before. Incredibly powerful message to our organizations and to everybody else. 
that's got to continue. And if you see that start to separate, just like in this budget environment, you see the services start to separate, we're all in trouble. Yes. Admiral, given that I trust your opinion a lot more than that of uh, Mr. Dennis Rodman, uh, what's your read on the North Korea situation? Especially I don't know. I'm a basketball player. <laughs> <laughs> class, it's interesting, and I just handed back the second paper for the students, and out of the 18, three of them wrote on Korea. Uh, this paper was a policy brief, options and recommendations to a decision maker. I got three different solutions, um, and uh, in fact, sort of in capstone now, next week, we're gonna, they're going to present those, and we're all going to talk about that. This is an enormously complex, difficult issue. First of all, the worst thing that can happen is have conflict right now. Secondly, you know, and longer term, him with nukes is a really bad idea because he's a proliferator, uh, and if he gets them, you know, the norm is South Korea goes back and looks in that file and says, well, maybe we ought to pull this out, so does Japan, despite what we assert. Um, and it, with China in particular, we're juxtaposed juxtapositioned in terms of what's important. So for us, the nukes are important. For China, stability is important. So how do you, and, and contrary to a lot of what people believe, and I went through this, we went through a very significant similar kind of thing in 2010 with his father. Uh, what surprised me in that was um, the limits that actually Beijing had with respect to Pyongyang. Uh, they, they certainly have influence, but to think they have control, you're a long way from it. Uh, there is, and this is a cultural issue, there, the, the China, communist China, is not going to give up on communist North Korea. Not going to happen. So they're going to stay with it. We have to understand that. And I think we have to continue to, to engage uh, internationally, politically, diplomatically, and bring as much possible pressure there for a solution. And I think my own view is, you know, by and large, in the longer run, that's probably best done by China. But it's not going to happen exclusively. And we need, China thinks that if, one, as one of the senior leaders explained to me, China thinks if the North goes, what China has now is just a permanent aircraft carrier in that whole peninsula. And that scares them to death. And so somehow we've got to tell them that's not going to happen, because that certainly isn't our intent. <coughs> um, it's, it's, uh, the, the situation is a little more accelerated now, meaning uh, you know, he's actually done all the provocations almost all at once, tested his nukes, fired his missiles, et cetera. He hasn't killed anybody in South Korea. The danger is that his, uh, her, the president's predecessor, President Lee, after the last incident, they, they're going to change, they're going to respond. They've never responded through heinous provocations in the past that go back to the 80s, I think, if not, including you know, assassination attempts, knocking down an airplane, all those kinds of things. And they haven't responded, and this is, I think, instructive, they haven't responded so their quote unquote economy can drive, and obviously that's done. But now look at the potential price you might have to pay for that. Uh, if, and, and so you're going to have, I think, if he does something and kills South Korean citizens on their land, then there's going to be a response. That's new behavior. The North has never seen that. When you have new behavior, not many ways to communicate, uh, you can't. You can't get it right. So, that, that, I mean, that's a, that's, this is Mike Mullen talking, that's a real worry. And you've got to, uh, not to disparage young people, but he's 30. Okay? He's 30. That's all the experience he has. Uh, and he comes from a very, very, you know, a family that is a very, very provocative uh, family and an e my view, an evil family who starves their people and all that. So back to sort of this matrix, or sorry, this framework, we're concerned about security, we're concerned about democracy, we're concerned about human rights, human security, and yet they die by the thousands every single year under this leadership. So what do we do about that? How do we do that? 
there's no, there's no clear solution. I'm, I'm hopeful that it will continue to be contained and that somehow the problem with the 30-year-old is we have no idea. He has no track record. He's actually got, he's got a track record that's fairly recent uh, that's tied to Chonan, the ship sinking, as well as the, the killing of the Marines. You've got new leadership in Japan. You've got new leadership in South Korea. You've got new leadership in China. You've got new leadership, new leadership in North Korea. So the mix is, the mix is worrisome. Me. And I don't know, I actually don't know how it comes out. I don't know how it comes out. Okay. Sir, what is the final question? Okay. You said, if you were right, correct, you said we have to do everything. And uh, Eric Fromm said that. You can't just make one change here because it's going to make everything else work. I, I have, uh, I'm trying to push perspective again. I have uh, outlined what I think is a pretty good strategic plan. And, so, and I really like to take, take a look at that. Uh, okay. And uh, it's a uh, uh, and the thing in Syria, uh, we have really good international law. Siding with a rebel army in a country is against international law. And we have to have a rule of law. That's one of the yeah. thirty-three things. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. No, that, and that's actually in that values menu. I'll take one more. You. And <laughs> 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 a plea. Okay. How did you get here? <laughs> <laughs> Admiral, you discussed the changing role of the United States. Now, in the context of countries like North Korea and Syria, where do you feel our ethical obligation begins to intervene in these countries? Is it some magical red line? Is it a uh, violation of human rights? Or do we even have an ethical obligation to intervene? Yeah, I do think we have an ethical obligation, and we do have a moral obligation. Um, and uh, on the, you may recall in Libya, the reason we went in was to stop a human massacre. I need to. I've said this too many times. I got to go look it up. I think the number we were talking about back then was 25 or 30 thousand <coughs> that we expected them to kill. And now, as was pointed out to me, that was a, you know, um, uh, Benghazi. That area is got three quarters of a million people out there. So the the idea clearly was to stop that. The same. I still. I have the same question. You know, where does this go? What's next with respect to this? Um, one of the issues that's playing, and it has relevance whether you believe it or not is, and it has relevance in North Korea and it has relevance in Iran, was that what you've seen discussed in terms of, well, that I could give up is no weapons, how'd that work out? Uh, and I actually think that's an irrelevant, but you know, if you're the 30-year-old or you're in Iran, that's not irrelevant. Uh, and it's proven historically that if you have these, people have to deal with them. He, it's, a, it's, a, it's a ticket to the table, if you will. Uh, and there's, there's a practical reality of that. Um, the way I would try to address the issue, the, the moral responsibility, is uh, working my way through at least an internal understanding that I'm going to have to do this at some point. But I want to answer the question of where does this go if I do it? And I want to do as much to try to create that end state with this as an interim step, whether it's near term or longer, or whether the end state is immediate. And nobody, I don't care what anybody says, nobody knows what the end state is uh, here. The comparisons between Libya, it's, it's almost, they're almost not comparable. Just geographically, the differences, just the sectarian, the ethnic, groups that are in Syria, the positioning with respect to uh, Hezbollah and Lebanon, the link to Iran, the, the support from Iraq, the <coughs> lack of an Arab coalition, it's, it, it's, there, it's just almost night and day when you really dig into it. Um, uh, the, and, and you know the same kind of thing is there. Okay, we just support the rebel army. Who are the rebels? That's part of the problem. I mean, that's tied to, tied to who gets the weapons. And the longer it goes, you may get a lot more weapons of the good guys, but you got a lot more bad guys in there. Um, uh, which gets me back to what I would try to pursue, what I would do, and I'm not creative here, but I've had this discussion, and it seems it makes a lot of sense, is I figure out what I want to do. I go to see Putin, figure out what his interests are, 
I then sit down with Erdogan and Hussein uh, and Morsi and uh, you know, the Lebanon uh, government as well as Netanyahu and say, okay, let's talk about everybody's interests and where do they overlap and, and does that overlap create enough solution space here? I'd want to work my way as hard through that as I could and then there's going to, I don't know what the number is, there's going to be a threshold where you just can't live with it anymore. You just can't live with it. Uh, I would hope that, I don't know, because I'm not inside, I would just hope that that kind of work has been done and that there is sort of a strategic view here. Uh, I, just, I just don't know. If you don't do that, you will come up, will come up, continue to come on to more of, okay, it's chemical weapons now, now what do you think? Or if that's not a red line, let's draw another one. I don't even like the term anymore because it's so badly politicized. What does it mean? I don't mean just here. I'm not talking about President Obama. I'm talking about red line. The words, you know, there almost is no such thing as a red line anymore because every time somebody paints one and somebody crosses it, we redraw it uh, or someone redraws it. So that's the kind of that's the kind of calculus that I would kind of the kind of strategic approach I try to take. Um, and the outcomes, I mean, there's no great outcome. There's no good outcome here. Um, and there is a piece of this, and I get this, that you know we're going to be remembered for what we did and didn't do and when we did and didn't do it. That's just, uh, that's just a practical fact. OK, so I'll give you my email address, and I need at least five solutions from each of you <laughs> <laughs> at the end of this time. So I'm, Anyway, thanks for focusing here, and, and actually including our young folks, because I think they're the ones that, they're going to live a lot of this for a long time. So, thanks. Sir, on behalf of the Stockdale Center, I'd like to say thank you and to present you, not that you need it, but present you with a moral compass, a Stockdale moral compass. Okay. Um, thank you very much, sir. And, uh, what happens, what happens when you retire and you move as often as we've moved? You know, we actually just moved back into our home over here, not very far away. And I've got 30 years worth of stuff and five years worth of room. <laughs> uh, I appreciate this. I'll put it in an appropriate place. <laughs> If I could just have everyone's attention for a few moments for some closing remarks, I would genuinely appreciate it. It's a tough act to follow, but uh, I'm going to try. On behalf of our director at the Stockdale Center for Ethical Leadership, Colonel Art Athens, uh, who could not be with us uh, over the last couple of days, I would like to genuinely express to all of you uh, my deep personal appreciation uh, for taking the time out of your busy lives to spend the last two days with us here. Uh, there, are also, there are also some specific individuals I would be uh, truly derelict if I did not uh, specifically recognize. Uh, first, uh, Dr. Ed Barrett, uh, who is our Director of Strategy and Research, who worked tirelessly to uh, orchestrate and choreograph this conference to get all of the, uh, the distinguished speakers that we've had here for the last two days to sequence them and to do a lot of the uh, planning, uh, an extensive amount of planning that goes into this conference. So Ed uh, deserves uh, some specific recognition, as well as uh, two other very special individuals, Miss Marge Bem, as well as Miss Jacqueline Dana. Uh, so all of the hard work. Marge and Jack here in the back, and they're far too modest to, uh, to acknowledge any kind of kudos that we may uh, give them, which they have absolutely earned. But uh, all of that hard work that Ed does would truly be uh, all for naught were it not for Marge and Jacqueline. So we truly do owe them a, uh, a sincere word of gratitude. And uh, I'd also like to uh, thank Dr. Sean Baker. Sean, uh, I don't even know if he's here right now. He may be behind the curtain. But uh, Sean has been uh, blogging and posting copiously over the past two days uh, so that the outside world, all of our friends and followers remain plugged in with all of the goings on at the conference and uh, making sure that the dialogue uh, is proliferated beyond the walls of the uh, Naval Academy. So, uh, and Sean was also critical 
in uh, managing all of our invitations and our, our web outreach and RSVP. So Sean did a tremendous job as well. So these, these events never come together by accident. They're the result of lots of hard work by dedicated individuals. So uh, thank you very much. And uh, I'd just like to say a few more things. Over the course of this conference, uh, we've heard from a, a bona fide all-star cast of experts and thought leaders on the diverse set of challenges currently facing our nation and what the ethical dimensions of some of those challenges are. They each uh, have given us all a great deal to think about. And as we prepare to adjourn the conference and to depart this beautiful campus, it is my foremost hope, and that of Colonel Athens as well, I assure you, uh, that each of us feels a renewed commitment to continuing the dialogue that will ultimately shape the approach that we as a nation take to confront and ultimately, I hope, to solve uh, these extraordinary national challenges. Uh, as my departmental leading chief petty officer uh, on the USS Elrod, FFG 55, told me early on in my assignment as chief engineer, uh, as we surveyed the vast and seemingly insurmountable challenges that lay before us on a 21-year-old uh, frigate, he said, sir, there's only one way to eat the elephant, one bite at a time. And uh, I chuckled. But uh, he was right, he was right. But perhaps we've taken the first of what must be many future bites of this critical debate here over the past two days. I hope that on some level that we've inspired you to take some of those bites as you leave us this afternoon. And uh, there are some uh, conference evaluation forms in your folders. If you would please take a few moments to fill those out and give us your, your feedback, we would certainly appreciate it. Thank you so much again for making this possible. Without you, there is no McCain conference. Safe travels back and uh, God bless.